Good evening. Flomera is developing a breast cancer screening tool that requires a single drop of blood. If you have a grandmother or mother over the age of 40, you've probably heard how uncomfortable, inconvenient, and painful a mammogram is. Or perhaps you have a friend, girlfriend, or sister between the ages of 20 and 39 who's currently not regularly screening for breast cancer. Well, Flomera can provide a solution for both problems. For the women over 40, it eliminates the need to have a mammogram. Only after Flomera has detected breast cancer would a patient need a mammogram. For the women under 40, Flomera provides a safe and reliable screening tool that can be done each year. The Flomera solution consists of a benchtop unit and a microfluidic chip. The process is simple. You insert the chip into the benchtop, collect a sample of blood, inject the blood into the benchtop unit, push a button, and then results are clearly displayed. This test can be run in less than 10 minutes and significantly reduces the cost to serve. This patented technology uses cell stiffness to separate cancer cells from normal cells and can significantly reduce the number of false positives as well as false negatives. To bring this to market, we will need FDA approval. We expect to need $4 million in the first three years to conduct phase one and phase two clinical trials. In year four, we'll have a major decision in our hands to either sell this technology to a large enterprise or raise an additional $13 million to fund phase three clinical trials. After approval in year seven, we hope to follow a typical adoption rate of a new healthcare technology of 1, 5, and 15%. We'll sell this using the razor razor rate strategy where we will sell the benchtop unit for at cost and sell the generate most of the revenues through the individual disposable chips. We'll use distributors such as McKesson to sell to doctors and hospitals throughout the U.S. as well as partner with nonprofits such as Susan G. Komen and CDC. But ultimately, we want to generate, uh, we want to create general awareness. Let the women know that there is an alternative to the painful mammogram, and that when they go to the annual gynecology exams, they'll ask for the Flomera test. We believe this will have a huge impact in the U.S. as well as globally in the future. Right now, this test has been specifically designed for breast cancer, but it also can be adapted or licensed out to big pharma to develop other types of cancer screening tools. We are Flomera, and we have developed a breast cancer screening tool that requires a single drop of blood. We hope you'll think about the women in your life and help us not only reduce the health, cost of health care, but also improve the lives of wives, sisters, mothers, and daughters. Thank you for your time. OK, judges, you have five minutes. As, as the, the woman judge, I, I just want to tell you how pleased I am because this, when I was reading about it and listening, this is going to have a major impact on women all over the world. And, you know, I, we talked a little bit about the fact that you need an, an awful lot of money to, to get this going. Four million? Four million in the first three years to conduct phase one, phase two. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And have you thought about where you would get that? We hope to raise about half a million dollars of that using public funding, such as SBIR, NIH, Georgia Research Institute. Right now, this can also be used in a research laboratory to separate uh, stem cells, which does not require FDA approval. So we hope to generate some revenues through that channel while it's going undergoing um, FDA clinical trials. Thank you. Well, clearly you have a tough road ahead, but um, a tremendous mission. Um, and something that would obviously make uh, a difference in the lives of at least half the people in this room directly um, and for the indirectly the other half of the people in this room so for that I thank you very much um, but you need a lot of money you've got a long time before there's validation that you can even bring this to market um, and you want the support of quite a lot of folks in order to assemble your four million dollars for the initial stage why why should we put our faith and trust that you folks are able to take this all the way through to make this a reality? Absolutely. So we have a great team. Uh, we're a part of the Tiger team. Both Jessica and I will be interning at a healthcare company this summer. I graduated from Georgia Tech with a biomedical engineering degree and will be black belt certified and will be in charge of the operations department. Jessica's worked six years in revenue management and will be in charge of our sales and marketing role. 
Bill Wayne, our PhD, has lived and breathed the technology for the past four years, and we have a strong relationship with, PhDs of, with his PhD advisor, who hope to use it as, his, uh, as a vehicle to commercialize further research. We also have a JD in our team who will deal with the intellectual property of that. So we all have all the ingredients to make this into a successful company. We just need funding to get it started. I appreciate that. Um, obviously, if you get your FDA approval, everything is wonderful and hunky-dory. So the sales marketing component is the least of the problems, although I certainly respect that talent amongst the team. And, and um, building a strong go-to-market strategy and distribution is critical, ultimately, to the win. What, uh, let's, us, let's take for granted for a moment that you get your $4 million, you go through this process. Okay, first off, are you really convinced that $4 million is sufficient for you to get through the first stage? Um, and, and just as a follow-up to that, um, how do you know, okay, that once you get through the $4 million and you get to that stage um, that, and you get your FDA approval, okay, right now you're still sitting there and, and have issues with whether or not, I mean, you've got to raise a considerable second stage round, okay? So an investor, an early stage investor, to some degree, this is an all or nothing return. Could be great if it hits, will be absolutely nothing if it doesn't. Okay, so give us some, some comfort level that this is more likely to be a hit than a, oh my gosh, I wish Flomera had worked. <laughs> All right, uh, absolutely. So we've reached out to um, a strong network of entrepreneurs right here in Atlanta, and we actually have one in the back that we spoke to uh, last night that is interested in investing in our company right away. So right, have, right now we're generating hype by attending events like this to form networks so they to get people interested in this. Um, besides that, do you guys anything else to add? <laughs> one more follow-up. Yeah. Last, last one and I'm done, okay. I promise. I'll pass the mic and leave it there. Um, have you reached out to any of the natural partners who would um, be involved in distribution later to see whether or not they would like to get an early stage investment in because you're dependent upon distribution at some stage anyway. We have not reached out to McKesson yet, but I will be working for Life Technologies this summer, which is a very strong healthcare technology, so we'll definitely be pitching to them and see what happens. Thank you. Yeah, so do you see any hurdles on the customer adoption side? I can understand the regulatory uh, and the FDA approvals uh, impediment, uh, but the adoption of this product would require some amount of behavioral changes on the surgeon's side or the doctor's side. So but what are your thoughts on adoption hurdles for this product? Well, for adoption, we believe that gone colleges will definitely adopt this because this creates an extra revenue stream for them. Instead of referring mammograms out to a clinic, they can do it in-house in 10 minutes and they know whether you have breast cancer or not. And they can uh, discuss next steps with them right here in the office. Um, so I think healthcare technology will definitely adopt this. Uh, as for, uh, we also believe insurance companies will also benefit from this because it will help them reduce the cost. Because if we can detect the error, it will minimize the uh, number of treatments further down. Uh, we'll be treated earlier and catch it earlier. Those are great answers. Thank you so much. Thank you, judges. Thank you. Up next, we're going to have Vane to Vane, and while they get set up, um, I just want to share a couple of statistics about the I2S program. Um, I talked earlier about the 60% increase in applications, but uh, there are 29 teams that competed in the semifinals. There were 35 who applied, who created the intent to compete. Um, there were 82 students in total, representing 14 different schools, and a shocking 25% of them are from the College of Mechanical Engineering. Are you ready? Okay. Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Rohit. I'm involved in the Wayne to Wayne uh, project, which is part of the Computing for Good program at Georgia Tech. So what is Wayne to Wayne? Wayne to Wayne is a software solution designed to address uh, blood safety issues in country, developing countries of Africa. So when it comes to blood safety, there are two main problems. Uh, the first one is the shortage of blood. This is a chart from the WHO website, and it shows that um, in, in several countries of Africa, the red portions indicate that there are less than five donations per thousand people in the, in the country. 
And uh, this results in inavailability of blood during surgeries or uh, diseases which, which, uh, which require blood transfusion at the right moment. So this is the first issue which concerns uh, the countries of Africa. The second is uh, unsafe blood. So um, the, uh, it is, uh, the statistics tell us that about 5 to 10% of the HIV transmis trans uh, transmissions happen due to transfusion of unsafe blood. And um, HIV uh, transmission is, uh, the chances are higher uh, compared, uh, uh, the chances of HIV transmission are higher uh, with blood transfusion, unsafe blood transfusion, than through other means like uh, from mother to child or from, uh, from uh, due to uh, sexual contact. And uh, it is known that 68% of the people living uh, with HIV uh, in over the world are in Africa, in the sub-Saharan part of Africa. So this indicates that there is a problem that we need to address. Now, uh, the current state of blood service centers in Africa, uh, they maintain paper-based records to track the flow of blood, where, uh, what, where every blood, unit of blood is going. So this is an error-prone technique, because suppose you have a blood sample and you have a number on it. If you don't note it down by hand, you can't, uh, y there is a chance of making an error while noting it down. And the other problems that can occur is, uh, given a blood sample, you cannot tell the test results immediately if all your records are on paper. You, uh, if, but if you have a computer, you can immediately search for the results and see whether the blood is safe for use or not. The test outcomes are calculated manually. So if you have 10 tests which infer an outcome, whether the, HIV, whether the, first, uh, whether the sample has HIV, uh, HIV strains, so uh, those t our 10 test results have to be inferred uh, and that, that is error prone again. And it is nearly impossible to track donor history. So uh, whether the donor was previously uh, diagnosed with HIV or some other disease like malaria. So if you have a, a donor history tracking system, then you can prevent the donor from donating blood again. And uh, there is inefficiency in use of blood. So one of the things that WHO mandates is that uh, people should adopt practices where there is no inappropriate use of blood. Okay, time's up. Thank you so much. Okay, judges, you have five minutes. Um, although you didn't get to it here, could you, could you explain how, how you're going to fund this? Uh, so this is an open source software that we are developing at Georgia Tech. And uh, it has been funded by CDC. Uh, through the PEPFAR grants so far. And uh, we are working with organizations uh, who can deploy it in the countries of Africa. And uh, they will be providing, uh, they will be, uh, we, we don't make, uh, make, uh, intend to make any profit because we are using all um, uh, open source software for developing vein to vein itself. So uh, we are not investing any money, we are just investing our time. So the only funding we would require is to visit the countries uh, in order to conduct workshops or training for using the software. Thank you. Is this a cloud solution? Uh, no, this, this solution does not require internet because we cannot depend on internet in Africa. Mm -hmm. So it's a web browser based tool that can be deployed within a blood service center. Great, and have you worked with healthcare professionals in country in order to understand their needs? Yes, uh, so uh, we, ha we have developed prototypes of the software that the actual blood ser service centers um, users are using, and they are giving us feedback on what features we should include. Other than that, we have worked with uh, professionals from Africa, uh, from the Safe Blood from Af for Africa organization, uh, who came in last month and gave us uh, feedback on uh, what features must be there for a blood, blood service solution in Africa. And uh, we also had someone from Namibia who had developed the Namibia, who had architected the solution for Namibia, and he gave us feedback on what, uh, what the solution should look like. And I guess, lastly, um, how far are you from having it marketable? Uh, so we are, we are uh, targeting end of June for a workshop where we can have a pilot phase. We can deploy it in, the, in some of the countries we are already talking to. And from, uh, at that point, they can move from paper records to a computer-based system uh, at an affordable price. So uh, about two months, we want to get into a system where we, which they can use. And Learning from that phase, we will introduce more features. 
So my question is twofold. Uh, <clears throat> based on the pilots which you have conducted, mm -hmm. uh, what would be the top two, three takeaways which you've uh, received from the customers? And uh, secondly, going forward and uh, following up on uh, his question on the road to commercialization, mm -hmm. what are the next steps for you uh, to bring this product to market? Okay, um, so your first question is about uh, what, what are the hurdles we have faced? Uh, the key takeaways from the feedback. The key uh, takeaways from, from the feedback. Uh, so uh, the main, uh, main, solution, my main thing is that the things that work in US may not work in Africa. Uh, so uh, we have to learn from their, we have to adopt to their current practice so that they can adopt the software very easily. So uh, that, is the, that is one thing. Other thing is that the software should be very easy to use and maintain uh, it sh because they cannot afford to have system admins on site every time. So it should be fairly reliable. And of course, the internet is a thing I already mentioned. Um, uh, I'm sorry, what's the next question? Uh, regarding the road to commercialization, okay. what are the next imminent steps which you see in the process? OK. Uh, so uh, for, for distributing it uh, and maintain, uh, to sustain this, we have been talking through Safe Blood for Africa to an organization called Jembi. And during the workshop, we plan to, uh, um, to meet with them and show them the software. Um, uh, and they are a not-for-profit institution which can provide support and maintenance for the software. Given the fact that this is a localized solution mm -hmm. and you're trying to build a database of experiences and donor history, yes. how does that information get um, connected back to a master database where they have that insight shared? Okay, uh, so currently we have uh, developed a solution that works within a center, but we, we, and, um, we cannot depend on internet. So the, we plan to aggregate all the information into a central national, uh, at a national level, the information can be aggregated through, uh, let's say, pen drives or something, uh, some portable disk, and as, as we can develop a software algorithm to merge all that data. There, there could be duplication, for example. But those are solutions that we have, those are uh, problems that we have to address. Given the existing technology, cellular technology, is there a way to do it through cellular that might help to aggregate it more efficiently? Uh, yes, so we, we have thought about that. So at the very least, what we are planning is in the first stage, we'll manage the request management for blood. For example, the hospital could send an SMS uh, saying that we need five units of blood within a week for A positive. Uh, so that's the first step we can take. Going on, uh, moving on, we can also we have also considered using the SMS itself as a mode of trans transferring data, but uh, that is still in the research phase. So we have not uh, really zeroed in on that solution. Great answers. Thank you so much. <laughs> Our next team is going to be Blue Sky, um, and while they set up, and these teams are moving faster than I thought they were, so I'll be quick. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows, uh, I would guess people in this room do, the ILE offers a Eastern European Study Abroad program experience that is in Budapest, Prague, and Krakow. Um, this is an awesome program that Dory Papp has uh, been the leader on the last couple of years. Um, and it offers students a chance to develop their leadership skills by working with a local nonprofit, learn from lectures with the local community leaders, so you're talking about a very different cultural context, and to travel throughout Europe and still have time to relax and enjoy good food while attending cultural events and meeting new people. Um, if you don't know about this program, I'm sure you can stop by the ILE's office and they will be happy to tell you about it and tell you how to apply. Okay, you guys ready? Yes, we're ready. Which side is it? I'll go back on there. Go to the, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I got it. Okay, super. Good afternoon. Uh, our team name is Blue Sky. My name is John Hersom. This is Drew Mathias. Two members of our team that aren't here today are Clifton Pay and uh, Clint Oliarnik. We'll start in with that. The problem that we're addressing is unprecedented levels of toxic air pollution and the impact that it's having on public health. Our focus is on China but there are many cities and countries around the world that have the same problem. And the most harmful element of it is what's called PM 2.5. Uh, this is the, the particulate matter that's so fine that it can enter directly into the lungs and the bloodstream. So essentially what's going on is China's going through an industrial revolution, not unlike what we went through many, many years back. But the difference is the scale. 
with a population of 1.3 billion, um, <clears throat> the magnitude of industrial development is something like 40 times greater than what we experienced. And the impact on public health is equally great. There's been a dramatic spike in respiratory diseases, uh, birth defects, different types of cancers. And it's not only in the cities, but it's also in rural areas and in communities throughout the, the uh, country. There's a lot of solutions on the market, but most of them are not effective in blocking PM 2.5. Um, the most popular ones are the surgical masks and knit masks. They provide only psychological benefit. There are some effective masks out there that are N95 rated. They're more industrial or for sport use, and the average consumer uh, does not find them as appealing and in many cases is not even aware of them. So we've talked with you about the problem. What we'd like to do is propose a solution, which we call the Blue Sky Solution. Um, we believe it's not just about a product, but it's also about our business model, which we find is rooted in our triple bottom line approach. We spoke a little bit about uh, sort of this integrated solution where we take existing uh, N95 rated mass technology and filters and integrate it with a more fashion friendly textile or other types of solutions in addition to making an eco-friendly biodegradable filter. Um, in addition to being culturally agile and aligned with our external environment, we believe that these things will really drive our success to make our product simplistic, to make our product affordable, scalable, and give the largest amount of impact in the shortest amount of time. Again, our triple bottom line approach, social, environmental, and economic, increase awareness, increase adoption, decrease air quality issues, and we think the economics speak for themselves. We realize we have issues, risks, and challenges, but we think we have some good answers, and we can answer those in the Q&A, because we're almost out of time. Blue sky, atmosphere fashion filters, making an impact one breath at a time. Thank you. Perfect on the timing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, judges, you have five minutes. Do you have a prototype yet? No, we don't. That's actually our number one next step uh, after this is to do, uh, get engaged in product development and build a prototype. Yeah. Wow. So, so you, you don't since you don't have that, you don't have a, any idea what your costs are going to be. You're, you're in the very early stages. That's that right? correct. That's correct. Okay. Hmm. And we've, and I should say, we've done some obviously some research on some of the competing products out there and started to get an idea. But you know, in terms of a specific cost basis, I don't want to say anything because that's that's true. We're not we're not there yet. Yeah. So when we entered the competition, we were told it was an ideas competition. Mm -hmm. So present the best idea, and you can. If you do it effectively, you can get the money to build your prototype and do in-market research and all those sorts of things. But we do think it would be extremely cost-effective, and we've come up with some projections on what we think it would cost to um, produce a prototype and how to do some in-market research fairly effectively. Okay. So, so you are a little bit farther down the line. We, we are. We, I mean, over the last month or so, we've done some projections and gotten some ideas about what we think we might need to do. And maybe John can speak a little bit to what we think we might do for funding. Well, yeah. Uh, in terms of the, like a go-to-market strategy or to get funding, there's, there's a couple ways to go about this. But um, actually, in terms of putting in our own capital and also maybe looking at developing a, um, a website and a presence and developing a brand even if it's as, a, as an integrated reseller um, over there, and then introduce our own products. So, so we're playing with several different ideas um, that could actually be very cost-effective ways to, to quickly get into the market, uh, understand what's going on, and then introduce our products. And on the R&D side, we've talked to some people, um, and we're looking at talking with others here on campus, but we met with someone who uh, has a, a, a degree in textile chemistry, for example, that could help us to <laughs> put, pull things together. She's right there. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, there are several N95 solutions on the market, both throwaway and, and uh, more industrial. Mm -hmm. Correct. So what would make yours any different? So we believe the integrated solution is the innovation. So the point at which people don't want to look like there's something wrong with them and have that stigma attached to them with something that could be more user friendly and comfortable. So N95 rated masks, because they're so industrial, 
for long wear use, they're very uncomfortable and they generally leave a mark around your face. So we think we can integrate technologies and make them more comfortable and more fashion friendly. And, and on that, we, we actually did a, some ad hoc market research and talked to people in country and uh, the feedback we got was along the lines of what we're doing. Right. Great. And I assume you plan on producing or manufacturing in country? Yes. yes. And what would, where are your barriers to entry going to come from, given the fact that it's really a fashion component um, coupled with an in-country production of a, of a filter right. system that may already to some degree be in existence? Yeah. So we, we had batted around the idea of maybe partnering with somebody like Leaning that already has in-country resources and has the name in-country and probably has some of the textile advantages and then maybe also partnering with somebody like 3M to bring the technologies together. If we went to our next evolution, it would be to create our own self-adhering type of mask that would be a more advanced technology than what's existing in the marketplace. Would you agree that the path to market is relatively short? Or do you see this as a prolonged development? No, short. I think it's very short. <laughs> okay. Very short. And yeah. that being the case, it's all about distribution, right? Yes. So can you give me a little vision yeah. about your distribution strategy? Yeah, in, when we were over in China, um, it was, we actually experienced the, the air pollution that was absolutely toxic and did cause us, many of us to get sick. Um, it, the interesting thing was, and this again from a Western perspective, but the availability was almost nil. In the hotels, in tourist areas, there was nothing. There was nothing available. And, and so part of what we looked at was the, the channels was if we entered into the commercial channels, government, hospitality, hospitality things like that, um, it's wide open now. And that's part of the business model is um, really targeting the gaps that we see yeah. in the business models of some of the competitors. Out and there. we believe by partnering with in-country companies as well as with the government, we can take some of the profits that we make and put them back into combating pollution at the source. So it wouldn't just be the stopgap measure of the public health related issue. It would be how do we tackle the source of the pollution by putting some of our profits to making sure that happens. Yeah, and that's a key element of it is the, is the business model where we're giving back to the community and working with government and industry there. Uh, so what are your top two question. hurdles to success? Sorry? Like the top two hurdles to success? Uh, prototype development. What will, not, what will make this not work oh. in the market? Nice. Yeah. I mean, number one is just developing a product, developing a prototype. That's obviously the first one. Um, and then I think probably the second is we'd really like them to be um, options for seasons, for gender, and for age. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously a baby's face is very differently shaped than a, an adult face, so we would need to tackle how would you go to market, who would you go to first, and what type of seasons and genders would you target first? Okay, thank you. Thank Great you. answers. <laughs> Next, we have an, a Nemo check. Um, and while she sets up, which is probably gonna take two seconds, I wanna tell you that there's a leadership minor in the College of Management. Um, students who minor in the leadership studies gain in-depth knowledge of leadership theory along with opportunities to practice their skills in real organizational settings. The capstone course of this leadership minor matches students with local social organizations like the KIPP Metro Atlanta, MedShare International, Jacob's Ladder, and the PATH Academy. And again, I'm guessing you can go to the office of the ILE here in this building on the fourth floor um, and inquire about how to get involved in that program. So, a Nemo check. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Erica, and I want to tell you a little bit about anemia. Um, it's the world's most common blood disease, affecting 2 billion people yearly, um, 83 million of which are in the United States. And of those 83 million, 12 million have chronic blood disorders, where they're screened for anemia once a month and even once a week in some cases. Now, what this means is they go to the hospital and wait and have to endure a venous blood draw and wait more for people to process the results. This is just something that people don't want to do on a weekly basis. In addition, one in three people are anemic in the developing world, and one million die needlessly every year due to anemia. I think the key to solving this worldwide problem is diagnosis because current treatments are completely curable in most, of the, most of the time. So I'm proud to present AnemoCheck, our solution. It's a simple, quick, and accurate way to screen for anemia in the comfort of one's own home. It's very simple to use. All one does is performs a finger stick, collects blood into a small tube, mixes that blood with our chemical tube, 
and waits. After 45 seconds, the final color in the tube, as you can see here, correlates to a hemoglobin level. It's very simple to do, very inexpensive, and disposable after that. Now, I've been working on this project since my undergraduate career in senior design um, in the biomedical engineering department. And since graduating in 2012, we've been hard at work on interference testing and validation of this design. Um, we've tested on hundreds of patients, and I'm pleased to say that we are IRB approved at the Emory University Hospital um, to begin testing, um, and we have been. Alongside that, we are prototyping with the Global Center for Medical Innovation um, in making a user-friendly user -friendly product. Uh, this, is, if this is something that's going to be disposable and inexpensive and easy to pick up off the shelf. It's got to be easy to use and safe. So those are chief concerns that we are addressing. At the conclusion of our clinical assessment this year, we want to publish our results scientifically and shortly after submit a 510K to the FDA for approval. That said, we want to form an LLC for-profit company in the United States first um, to make our profits um, here. In two years after that, after accruing some profit, we want to either partner with an existing organization, the CDC, WHO, something like that, or form our own sector to offer at-cost test, at, at cost price um, tests for those in the developing world. That said, Ideas to Serve can help us by giving us this money to kickstart that. We really want to start our stability, um, our bioawareness um, studies on the um, developing world aspect of our product. And that's how you guys can help us today. Thank you so much. OK. So if you're in a developing country and you identify that you have anemia, and what are the costs associated with the treatment of that once, once you know that, in fact, you've got it? That's a very good question. Um, the current treatment for a lot of these are iron supplementation um, or better nutrition, better hydration, um, which are completely doable um, for the most severe cases of anemia. So one of the biggest problems is the threshold into diagnosis. Um, but once that is done, I believe the resources are there and implemented um, to treat the most severe cases, the people, the million people each year that are dying because of anemia. Thank you. Thank you. Under the current solution um, portion of your, your uh, paper that was submitted, you say that the WHO has developed a color scale um, and the approximate cost is about five cents yes. to apply that solution. And you talk about your solution having a cost to you uh, under the proposed solution section of about a quarter, which is five times that uh, amount. Do you see that as any barrier to entry? I don't think so. Um, the WHO and CDC have admitted flaws with this um, testing method. It has not been implemented very well. Uh, the color scale in and of itself is um, taking a drop of blood and drying it on a piece of paper and then comparing that shade of red to other shades of red. Um, and the color of blood varies between people um, and that is known. False positives and false negatives are a big deal in this situation, um, addressing back to your question, where resources do need to be spent on the people that are the most severely anemic. Thank you. Uh, so, so core to this device is the chemical which you're using for the tests. Uh, so can you uh, educate us about the availability of, that, of this chemical in the markets in which you're, in the developing markets in which uh, you're trying to roll this out, and if it's not available there, what would it take you to get this chemical imported in these countries, uh, considering the import restrictions, and also if there are any restrictions on how, in, how logistically you need to deliver the chemical to make it most effective? That's a very good concern. Um, I will say that we are a little bit uh, on the new side in considering that. Um, but I will say the chemical itself is off the shelf in the United States. In many research laboratories, it's used um, during ELISA testing. Um, and it's just never been used as a whole blood hemoglobin diagnostic, or any kind of diagnostic for that matter. And that is something we will have to consider. Um, I believe that there is rapid testing that has gone, um, that have involved chemicals that are, have not been available in Africa and Southeast Asia that have gone through the CDC and WHO as rapid testing. And we do have someone from the CDC on our project. And I do think we can address those matters with those connections we have. And I'm assuming this will be a class two medical device. 
Yes. Right. Uh, so how long do you think it'll take you to get a pre-market approval? Right. With our um, FDA 510K, we plan to submit. Um, and what's great about our technology is that the chemical is well known in the scientific world, and we just have a completely different use for it. So scientifically, it is it has a reputation for working. Um, we envision a very quick process on the 510K turnover uh, between one and a half and two years. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one more question, if the judges have any. All right. Fantastic. <laughs> Very comprehensive. Thank you. We have one last presenter. This is the Pentorship Program. Um, so you're in the home stretch. I hope everybody's been keeping up with their notes on their People's Choice Awards, and you're getting your questions ready um, for when all of the contestants or presenters come back up. Um, the thing I want to tell you about this time, our little tidbit of information, is that this year, Georgia Tech and the ILE in particular became the newest partner for partner university for the Global Social Venture Competition. Um, if I understand correctly, this is a consortium of schools, including the Columbia Business School and the London Business School and the uh, Haas College of Business or, or Haas School of Business at uh, Berkeley, and they come together and conduct this program. As the recruiter for the Southeast, they were very effective in finding a healthy number of teams to participate in the project, and they have advanced a team into the finals that you might recognize from the I2S competition last year. It's TOL, Tubing Operations for Humanitarian Logistics. Um, they were at Startup Chile, and now they're headed out to the West Coast to, to participate in the GB. GSVC. Um, so, without further ado, your last presenter, the Pentorship Program. Five, the U.S. accounts for 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prison population. $70 billion is spent every year on correct. And more than 2 million children have incarcerated students. The mentorship program provides entrepreneurship, technology, and crowd mentoring to fight recidivism for this problem. Now, entrepreneurship and mentoring are nowhere new to the prison landscape, but what makes us uh, unique is that we actually have a curriculum based on past experience and input from incarcerated individuals who have already become entrepreneurs. We also believe that participants in our program can actually be more effective in the programs that they enter once they leave prison if they um, are involved in this internship program. And we want to partner with those organizations to help see our people in Our course, one of this course is three phases. It covers the, idea, the ideation phase of business planning, personal development, and actually a business model canvas as well as I was talking loud, huh? <laughs> business model canvas, business plan, and case studies so that they can earn points from people who will provide pro bono services to help them offset the cost of capital. Once they're complete, they're ready to move forward with their lives and use their service points to help them start their business. So as for the crowd mentoring, we're using a, a project management system that allows mentors from anywhere in the world to be able to look at business plan and documents provided by, uploaded by the, um, by us for the, the inmates, sorry, I'm nervous. And um, those, those, that feedback is provided and sent back to the inmate through the mail. Our next steps are to recruit more volunteers, establish partnerships, find mail reps to help us upload documents on behalf of inmates, and also establish Project X. So the Pentorship is a nonprofit, but what we like to do is completely cover our cost of operation in the future with Project X. Your Thank you. Up. 
Okay, judges, are you ready? Project X is, would be a joint venture that would provide software, an actual module within the prison so that inmates can self-learn um, coding, you know, graphic design, and possibly any kind of post-secondary content that other content creators provide as applications onto that platform. So that is a um, revenue generation tool. It could also be used outside for other commercial use um, for any um, individuals where there's a high risk for them to have access to the internet, but they still need to develop technological skills. And have you talked with people that run the prisons? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, actually, what kind of feedback? a lot of good feedback. And, and the reason why that's happened is because it, it kind of took a long time for us to get where we are today. The mentorship program is two years old. We started off with a model that didn't necessarily work for everyone in the country. So I took the time out to go visit California, New York, Florida, um, talk with people um, who are you know, executive directors of current programs as well as prison staff. And the, the project that we presented today and the one that we're actually implementing now is more effective and we've received um, better, you know, a better relationships. So we actually have a relationship with the Georgia Department of Corrections and um, San Quentin State Prison in California, and the Bureau of Prisons came to support us at the event on Friday. Thank you. Thank you. I've had the opportunity to be in several of these prisons that we supply books to and that we have um, post-release um, employment uh, relationships with, and one of the biggest problems they have is just general literacy within the prison population. Mm -hmm. um, and here we're talking about creating entrepreneurs who can uh, start businesses on their own. Wouldn't the better focus be to create literacy and, and um, degreed programs within the prison population be a little bit more fitting for that group? Um, actually, our curriculum is based on an opposite methodology. The best thing about the business model canvas is that it's visual. So people that um, go into the mentorship program, they don't have to have a certain literacy level to dream. And we think that's very important because when you kind of have an idea of what kind of business you want to start later on in life, it encourages you to actually take care of the things that you need to take care of in your personal life. And so just going into the prison, I went to a prison in North Georgia, and they were so excited about the business model canvas. And, I, and there's guys that are 55 years old, and it gets them excited because you don't have to have a certain literacy level. So that and also not taking the um, MBA approach to teaching, we don't believe we can make entrepreneurs. We believe that we can help people set realistic goals, whether that be even to go um, into transitional work knowing that they have certain skills that they need to obtain in order to become a more effective business owner. So we actually kind of take, take the opposite approach and use that as encouragement for somebody to want to read one of your books. That's great. I appreciate that. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you. Um, one last question. Now, you've been doing this for a few years. And, and yes, sir. Do you have any success stories you can share with us? Um, we, our success story really is how long it took for us to get in. Um, you're familiar with the the prison arena. So they are very um, skeptical until you can prove that something is safe. So as of January 23rd, we've actually had uh, 17 new people register, which is a big deal because usually programs that work with prisons, they work with 17 people throughout the entire year rather than 17 people within two or three months. And so we've got a lot of great partnerships coming ahead. Um, this time next year, we'll definitely have um, success stories, but right now our success is just being able to have exposure to so many um, prisoners. That's great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about the content creation process as to where you're sourcing your content from? What are the quality control checks in place to ensure that the content which is getting delivered and disseminated in the, to these inmates is the right content for them to learn entrepreneurship? Sure, so there's a board member that specifically um, works with myself um, to develop the curriculum. His name is Donald Garner. He's a PhD candidate at Fordham University, specifically studying uh, prison 
to pipe, uh, school to pipeline, pr school to prison pipeline. And he has a background in reentry. He's a master social worker. He's worked in several reentry organizations. And he also trains teachers in New York. So Donald is um, very well versed in what it takes to integrate the things that are already seen as evidence based within reentry and kind of we're taking my business background and mixing that together to see how we can use business to pull out some of the aspects of the, those things that are actually proven from the evidence-based programs. The next step um, in terms of curriculum building is to establish a curriculum board of advisors. Um, we, I, I do rely on, um, actually, um, Georgia Tech staff member has recently helped me, Mr. Andre Dickens. So there are people in the community, re-entry, uh, we're looking to develop cross-sector -sec relationships in order to make that happen. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. <laughs>